Hello everyone, this is part 4 of what if Naruto had Wolverine's powers. Enjoy! Kakashi looked up as Kurenai entered the room, a nervous Uruka behind her. After assisting with the condolence gift for Ibiki, which consisted of a number of flowers that could be distilled to poisons and other drugs useful to a torture and interrogation specialist, Anko had left to get in place for her big entrance. As she sat down she looked at the odds and bets scrawled on the blackboard at the end of the room. I thought it was my job to be late, Kakashi said quietly as Kurenai got out her coin purse. Shaking her head, the red-eyed Kunoichi replied, had to arrange for a condolence basket for Ibiki. The odds on my team passing any of the exams look slim. The one-eyed Jonan nodded. Only a few people really know what he can do, and a lot of them have never seen Hinata as anything but weak. I've put a bit of money on both teams. So I see, my eternal rival, Guy said over Kakashi's shoulder as he sat on the other side of the copy ninja. Sasuke to reach the finals, but not make Chunin. Isn't that a little unyouthful? Kakashi shook his head as Asuma took a seat next to Kurenai, and Shinshi sat beyond him. Sasuke has the skills to be Chunin, but he lacks the necessary attitude and maturity. He's too obsessed with revenge or his clan, and tunnel vision isn't a good trait in a ninja. Kurenai called out her bet. 50 Ryo that team 8 makes Chunin. Silence reigned as the odds were furiously calculated and put up and others began scrambling to cover the bet. As she sat down, she noticed the lack of clan heads in the room. Hiyashi said someone called for a CRA invocation. That must be why the clan heads aren't here, she muttered. Any more on that? Asuma shook his head, but Shinshi spoke up. Counselor Haruno brought it up, he said. She apparently found a reference to the Uzumaki clan, and realized that with only one member alive, the CRA, had, to be enacted for the boy in the interests of, Konoha, which means whoever the council can convince to bribe them. Aren't you a little cynical for your age? Guy asked the youngest gentleman. Shouldn't you have a youthfully optimistic outlook as life decrees? Shinshi stared at the spandex-clad ninja. That was being optimistic, he deadpan. The room Naruto and his team found themselves in was heavily crowded, and as the other teams entered behind them, the doors closed. There were ninja from everywhere, but Naruto watched for those with a Konoha Hite 8 first. There were 8 such teams nominated, he knew, and he could see all of them here, including his own, Sasuke's and Lee's teams. As they stood there, and killing intent began to rise and flow towards them, he saw Team 10 approaching. Choji looked no different than his usual self, nor was Ino change, but Shikamaru looked like someone had really put him through a ringer, twice. Hey guys, Naruto called out as they approached. What happened to you, Shikamaru? The laid-back boy groaned. Remember how I said once that hating someone is too troublesome? He asked, and Naruto nodded. I've changed my mind. I really hate Shinshi-sensei. Dragging the story from him would have been like pulling teeth, so Naruto turned to a far easier source of information. Eno. Shinshi Sensei decided that Asuma Sensei's training regime wasn't really pushing us very hard, so he increased it a bit, had us multitasking, more physical training and sparring, a few extra jutsu each so we weren't relying on our clan's techniques all the time, that sort of thing, she told him. Then of course Shikamaru says it's all a drag and troublesome, and he'd rather just play shogi with Asuma. So Shinshi Sensei says, go ahead, play shogi but you have to do everything else at the same time and you can't look at the board. It took Shikamaru a few tries to start winning at Shogi again, and he's been kind of upset with Shinshi Sensei ever since. Hinata spoke quietly, but her stutter was a thing of the past now. You seem to like him, Ino, she said, curious despite herself. Ino giggled. I'm not crushing on him or anything, but Shinshi Sensei has this cool and villainous air about him. He said I wasn't active enough, and that I looked hungry. I told him I was on a diet, and he insisted I write it out for him. He looked it over and handed me a different one. When I complained about what it would do to my figure he just, smirked. And I felt this chill, and he said I'd just have to do more physical activity to keep my looks. She sighed, and not in a girlish, love-struck way. If anything she seemed exasperated. He's all about results and methods. 
It's like he has a goal in mind for us, and if we fall over before we get there, he'll just prop us back up and tell us to keep going. Choji grunted as he put a chip in his mouth. He's effective though. Looking around, Naruto realized all 12 of Konoha's rookie teams, those who were new to the exams, were right there by the door, and attracting unwelcome attention from the other teams. A white-haired young man, around 20 if Naruto were any judge, slinked closer. Can you guys please not attract too much attention, he muttered. I barely got through my first six tries at this, and I'd like to survive my seventh. There was something familiar about him. He wore the Konoha Hite 8, and a pair of glasses, but it wasn't his appearance that was nagging at Naruto. He was certain he'd remember in time, but did they have time? This stranger was still speaking, though. My name is Yakushi Kabuto, he finished up, even as Kiba took the bait. Six times, huh? He whistled, which seemed to annoy the other shinobi. Bet you know a lot about the exams, then. His fishing for information was obvious, and the white-haired man smirked. Of course, I have no way of knowing how they're being judged this time, but I have acquired information on all the other contestants at this time, he mentioned. I keep it all encoded on these handy ninja cards, and it requires my chakra to access it. As he brought out the cards, Naruto leaned over to Shino. How long does the chakra retain its signature when your kakaichu eat it, he whispered. Shino placed two fingers against his left bicep. About 20 minutes, then. Naruto's eyes narrowed. Sasuke was asking for information. Well, asking would be the polite lie. He was more demanding it. Tell me what you know about that one over there, he pointed at the redhead from Suna, as well as Neji Hayuga and Naruto Uzumaki. Oh, you make this too easy, Kabuto said as he set out his cards, and Naruto slashed his claws through them, retracting them swiftly enough that no one, except those who knew he had them, could be sure what they'd seen. Even the startled Kabuto was looking at his shredded cards. That was years of work, gone in a second. He turned to the orange-clad boy. What did you do that for? He snapped. Naruto stared at him. It was his smell, he decided. This man smelled familiar, but from where? If you think bringing those cards out in a room with so many ninja was a good idea, I can see why you failed six times. If any one of these ninja can siphon off your chakra, that information would be stolen. I'd like to know my enemies, too, but not at the cost of them knowing me. He turned back towards Shino and Hinata as the older shinobi stood, and began talking with them. Once the attention in the room had drifted away from him, he slid his hand from his pocket, revealing Kabuto's cards. Hinata smiled, and Shino nodded. The Kakaichu he'd seated the other man with would keep tabs on his location, and deliver his chakra when they needed it. When the cloud of smoke burst at the front of the room, a massive room now that Naruto thought about it, but still somewhat small for the large numbers of shinobi who had to be taking the examination, it revealed Morino Ibiki. The heavily scarred Jonin wasted no time. Each of you has been assigned a seating number, so I suggest you find your seat, he spoke resonantly, his voice cutting through any speaking taking place. As they did so, the genin took note that they were separated from their teammates. Now for the basic rules. Each of you has 10 points. You lose 2 points if you are caught cheating. 0 points means you and your team fail. There are 9 questions on each sheet. Getting an answer wrong loses you 1 point. At the end of the test, we reveal the 10th question. You have 45 minutes. Begin. Naruto knew something was up. He couldn't put his finger on exactly what, but nevertheless, it was a good idea to be prepared. The questions on this test were incredibly advanced he noted, almost too difficult for even Chunin who'd failed to study hard enough. The point deduction for cheating was annoying. But, wait, it was for getting caught cheating, not the cheating itself, he realized. They wanted them to gather information, and that was Team 8's speciality. A glance at Hinata told him she was using her Baikugan surreptitiously, and copying the answers of an accurate source. Haruno Sakura, so he listened for the way her pen sounded as she wrote. Shino had his kakaichu transmitting information in teams, tiny bugs that no one noticed. Sasuke's sharingan allowed him something similar, and Naruto didn't doubt that others had their own methods to acquire the information. 
As the time slipped by, the deputy proctors began calling out numbers instead of simply tallying marks on their clipboards, removing those ninja who were insufficiently subtle. One of the Suna ninja, Konkuro if he recalled correctly, raised his hand ad requested to use the bathroom, and was informed a proctor would accompany him. As he and the proctor who volunteered slipped past Naruto, he noticed that the proctor had no scent, and grinned. Did no one think to count the proctors? Or was this simply one of the first four times he might have been caught and still remained? By the time Konkuro had finished his business and returned, Ibiki had called the time. The test had only eliminated a handful of teams, there were still way too many. Hopefully the tenth question would bring the numbers down. All right, then, he said, seizing the attention of the entire room. Before we reveal the tenth question, you have a few more rules to learn. First, you can decline to hear the tenth question, at which point you and your entire team will score zero points and fail. There was a minor outburst at this. Second, he continued, cutting through the noise, if you do take the tenth question and get it wrong, you and your entire team not only fail, but you will be removed from duty as active shinobi, and banned from becoming such again. Shino saw his teammates' eyes harden at that. They had no choice, and had to reach promotion, so they would push forwards regardless. So he would too. As a few teams' nerves broke, they retreated from the room. The trickle gradually peeled away the numbers in the massive room, until finally, no more than 90 shinobi remained in their seats. It could have been fewer, though, as Ibiki began speaking. Excellent, he said, those of you remaining here have chosen to go on knowing the consequences of failure, into an unknown situation. Seated plants, you may withdraw. The equivalent of five teams of shinobi stood and waved at the proctors, and left the room. Those of you remaining, pass. Puzzled looks sprang up all over the room as Sakura asked the question on most of their minds. But, what about the tenth question? Ibiki smiled evilly. You already answered that, he said. The smile looked somewhat, no, downright sadistic on his face as he removed the bandana that obscured his scalp. The scars that liberally criss-crossed his scalp were a testament to the fortitude this man possessed. As shinobi, you do not always have the luxury of knowing what you're getting into, but sometimes you will know that death, or a worse fate, are waiting for you if you fail. A shinobi doesn't get to pick and choose their missions, and those who would retreat rather than take their mission are worth nothing as ninja. Now, the window shattered as a bundled figure smashed through it, hurling kanai attached to the corners of a banner into the ceiling and floor. As the pretty woman struck her pose, another kanai in hand, the writing on the banner proclaimed her to be Mitarashi Anko, proctor for the second exam. She wore a trench coat, a mini skirt, and a lot of netting, besides her Konoha Hite 8, and she called out as she stood there. Tremble now, little Jenin, the second exam is nowhere near as sedate. She paused, quickly counting, and whispered to Ibiki, You're slipping, there's far too many of them. I guess I'll have to clean up for you, again. She turned to the staring Jenin as she began yelling once more. All right you worms, you might actually make Chunin. Or at least survive the next exam. Follow me to training ground 44. With that, she leapt from the window, leading the headlong rush towards the zone nicknamed the Forest of Death. As Ibiki began picking up the test papers, Naruto cleared his throat. He and his teammates stood before the torture and interrogation specialist and they laid out the ninja information cards that Naruto had pilfered from Kabuto. Shino's Kakaichu crawled on the cards, injecting them with the white-haired ninja's stolen chakra, causing the cards to bring out all their information. Naruto spoke quickly, before Ibiki could. Morino-sama, he said, smiling, I think you should keep an eye on Yakushi Kabuto. No one who failed that many times is that confident and he seemed quite eager to share this information with the entire room, which would have included details about active duty Konoha Shinobi. The cards require his chakra to activate, but that's no challenge for an Abarame to acquire. As the three genin turned to leave, Ibiki cleared his throat. I'll have this checked out, he said, but two questions before you go. First, what raised your suspicions? Naruto shrugged. I've never seen his face before, but he smells familiar. Given the way my past has gone, that's not a good thing. If I remember more, I'll let you know. 
Second question. How did the rest of the genin not notice you staying behind, especially in those orange outfits, that two of you are wearing? It was Hinata's turn to answer, before they hurried to catch up with the other genin. Morino sama what color is a tiger? The fence was at least 20 feet tall around training ground 44. The very dangerous nature of the place made it one of Anko's favorite places in the world, despite the nickname, Forest of Death. As she explained this to the gathered genin, she spotted one of them, that Uzumaki Naruto that Kuranai spoke so well of, staring into the forest instead of paying attention. A hurled kanai, intended to wake him up was deflected over his shoulder with a negligent slap, where it landed close to a group of ninja from Kusagakure. Naruto, however, inhaled deeply. Hinata-chan, he said slowly as the Hyuga girl glared at the proctor. Hi, she replied, without pausing in her glaring. I like this place, he said. It's, honest, forest of death. It's not hiding, it just is. He turned towards the janin with purple hair. You were saying? Anko assessed the boy. He had been paying attention, she now realized. He was just paying attention to more than just her speech. The second exam is a survival mission, with a twist, she announced, in that each team will be issued a scroll, marked as an earth or heaven scroll. You will have five days to reach the tower within this training ground, against everything the forest of death can throw at you. However, it's not that simple. You have a couple of rules to follow if you want to succeed. First, you may not open the scrolls. You will not like what happens if you do, and then you will fail the test as well. Second, you cannot enter the tower unless you meet three conditions. You must get there within the five days, with both an earth and a heaven scroll. You must have a full team, if one of you dies, then you fail. Other than that, have fun. She pointed to a number of tables with paperwork stacked on them. Before you receive your scrolls in those covered booths over there, you have to fill out those waivers. They acknowledge that you are entering this test of your own free will, and that no one can hold it against us if you die or something. You hand in three waivers, and you get one scroll. After that, I'll see you later. Team 8 were the first team to grab their waivers and trade them in. Inside the covered booth, they received a heaven scroll and as they emerged they saw the purple-haired Jonan frozen on the spot as she spoke curtly with a grass nin with an excessively long tongue. That was apparently prehensile, by the kanai she was delivering to the proctor. The genin glanced at their gate number, and raced to get there. Inside the forest, Team 8 was more or less in their element. Between Naruto's ability to follow sense and Hinata's Byakugan, they could avoid most of the predators that would be a problem, and Shino's Kakaichu could scout on a level beyond what most could manage. Not even Naruto's shadow clones could match the numbers Shino had in his colony. Together, they began to set their plans. By unspoken agreement, the Konoha teams were avoiding each other as targets. Team 9 had the good fortune to encounter an unlucky band of a Megacure ninja with a heaven scroll, before the Rain Nin could set an ambush or battle plan. They then began a run for the tower, although Lee insisted they take some time to see how Sakura's team was managing. Ino stepped back out of her target's mind. They have an earth scroll, she told Shikamaru. Gah, he grunted. Even with all the training Shinshi Sensei put us through, getting the right scroll is going to be such a drag. Choji, can you make them go away? B-U-B-U-N-K-A-K-U-D-A-I no jutsu. The Akamichi's arm suddenly became massive as Shikamaru jumped away and the Kiri ninja stumbled as the Nara released them a fraction of a second before Choji's arm hit, launching them out into the forest. Ino held her hand above her eyes as she watched the other team disappear into the trees. Okay, let's find another ambush to bust then, shall we? Kabuto glared at his teammates. They were fools, but they were what he had. They and their, sensei, were actually deep cover agents, recruited by him for his master. The white-haired ninja was a little bothered by the loss of his cards. He'd been quite impressed by the skill it took to switch the cards he'd made for regular playing cards before Uzumaki destroyed them. There had only been two ninja close enough to manage the trick, and that Naruto, despite the rumors, Kabuto was certain the brat's only real talents lay in refusing to die when he should, and SL, aid of hand. Looking back at the hapless Takigakure team his companions had slaughtered for their scroll, he smiled. 
I'm going to check on something, he called out. I'll meet you at the tower in a few days. Naruto stared down from his hiding place at the clearing filled with sand, blood and bodies. A quick glance to Hinata followed by her nod, and he knew she'd seen the same thing too. None of the Suna ninja had so much as lifted a finger against this rain team. They didn't have to. Gara's sand had done all the work, and the rain ninja had died in a horrible way, buried alive and crushed by the sand. Gara glared at the scroll they found. Earth, useless, he growled, and looked at the bodies as he threw the scroll aside. Mother says they were not enough. She needs more blood. Come along. To the hidden eyes of Team 8, it seemed even Gara's family was terrified of him. Unnoticed, a swarm of Shino's insects recovered the scroll. It was not his day, thought Kiba as he leapt, ran, dodged a giant snake, leapt some more, sprang from tree to tree and dodged the giant snake again. The rock he and Akamaru had answered nature's call on had turned out to be a massive snake. One that was not happy with how they'd woken it up, to say the least. He'd been running for the past 10 minutes, and his stamina was starting to flag, and his sandal slipped as he hit the branch, toppling forwards while his partner fell back, into the snake's mouth. Kiba's wordless howl of despair rang out through the trees, and he shut his eyes as the snake closed its jaws, which was a real pity, as he missed the two orange blurs that skipped through the branches, one slamming both her feet against the underside of the very branch he'd just fallen from as Hinata caught him before he fell very far, swinging him to the next branch down where Shino was waiting to catch him, as the other blur sprang into the very mouth of the giant snake to gather up the small white dog. Naruto's wardrobe had needed some redesign after the mission to Nami no Kuni, and Kujaku Dansei had been quite proud of the outfit Naruto now wore, with the flaps and panels over the areas where Naruto could most easily manipulate his bones into protrusions. Knees, elbows, shoulders, shoulder blades and a whole series along his spine. As the orange-clad shinobi caught the ninja hound, preventing the small canine becoming an appetizer, he also pushed his chakra into those areas, and the bone metal spikes and blades emerged, driving into the soft tissues of the snake's mouth, convincing it that this meal wasn't worth the trouble. As the oversized serpent reopened its mouth, Naruto lashed out with his right hand, his claws extending, feeding his chakra into them to extend their reach and sharpness, and the claws broke through the snake's brain, whereupon the summoned creature vanished with a pop and a puff of smoke. Pulling in his spikes, Naruto hastily made a hand sign, and several of his shadow clones caught him, throwing him to the branch where his team waited with Kiba. Kiba-san, Shino spoke quickly once the boy was reunited with his best friend, where's your team? Surely you three didn't split up. Sasuke and Sakura glared at the grass ninja as she stood there, her head at a slight angle. The fact that Kiba hadn't returned had the two worried, but Sakura had taken it as a godsend, and was discussing the limitations of the CRA with Sasuke, a subject he'd had little interest in until she told him of the lack of choice he'd have until the stranger had entered their campsite. Now they stood ready to fight, but the sheer killing intent radiating from the other ninja had paralyzed them. As things stood they were in trouble. This ninja was too much for them. Sasuke pulled their heaven scroll from his equipment pouch, and held it up. This is what you want, isn't it? I can tell when we're overmatched, it's yours if you let us go. Sakura couldn't believe what she was hearing. Sasuke was giving up? What are you doing, Sasuke, she whispered. We can't advance without that. Sasuke spat to one side. For such an intelligent girl, you can sure say stupid things, he growled. We can't advance if we're dead, either, and there are other scrolls out there. Indeed, the other ninja said, stepping closer. Like this one. She held up an earth scroll and continued to approach. Not that I care, since my team is dead. Sakura's eyes widened. How? What happened to them? The grass ninja shrugged. They were in my way, so I killed them just to enjoy their screams. But even those were disappointing. Now I have you right where I want you. The Fuma shuriken that drove into the ground in front of the other ninja stopped her advance. Standing on the branches of the trees at the south end of the clearing were Team 8, Kiba and Akamaru who was happily barking at the two Konoha Genin. Naruto spoke up. I'd be careful about him, Sasuke, that guy smells of blood and snakes, he called out. 
I'd trust him as far as I could spit him, and there's nothing that would convince me to put anything of Orochimaru's anywhere near my mouth. The grass ninja began laughing with a mad intensity. So the little experiment lived, after all. I was wondering if it was you, boy. With an even more sudden focus, the ninja's hands flickered to begin a summoning, as the earth scroll he held was flicked up to spin in the air, obviously intended to land back in the summoner's hand once he'd finished. But that wasn't what happened. As the scroll began its upward arc, the Fuma shuriken popped revealing itself to be a transformed shadow clone, who then sprang upward and drove a spiky knee into the face of the ninja before him, snatching the scroll from the air as he did, and hurling it to Sasuke before dispersing. The blood pouring from the victim's face obscured their vision as the clone vanished, and Naruto's cry of, Plan 6, RTFA, was followed by a number of shadow clones dog piling the target ninja as the six genin fled. They were not expecting the sound of tearing flesh behind them, nor did they dream that the infamous missing nin was capable of stretching his neck so far biting into the muscle of Sasuke's shoulder and injecting something there. As the head fell back and away, and Naruto's shadow clones began to disperse at a prodigious rate, Orochimaru laughed. Should you live, Sasuke, you will need power for your vengeance. Come to me and I can give it to you. Naruto and Kiba caught hold of Sasuke before he could fall as the Uchiha passed out, and all five conscious genin pushed themselves hard to reach the tower before something worse happened. Reaching the tower was easier said than done, with a number of other teams lying in ambush, and the two teams were forced to take refuge in a massive hollow tree. Laying Sasuke's fevered form down, they inspected the injury that the snake master had inflicted. There was a bite mark, two half circles of teeth had driven through the skin, and inside those marks were three comma-like marks arrayed against each other in a circular pattern. The skin about them was reddened, and black veins seemed to carry the taint of the mark deeper into Sasuke's body. That's, not good, Naruto said. I know some basic sealing, but this thing is so far beyond what I know they're not even related. Hinata's use of her Byakugan had revealed the mark was forcing some kind of black chakra, a negative chakra, into Sasuke's system. By sealing some of his tenketsu around it, she'd slowed the advance, but things were definitely bad. It was to the scene of Sasuke's unconscious form that the other two Konoha teams reached this clearing. Each had managed to acquire the scrolls they needed, and all they needed to do was get to the tower. But that would not be as easy as it looked. Kabuto reached the tree above the clearing. Taking note of the numbers, he shook his head. Too many for Otogakir no Sato's official team, he decided. A pity, he'd have loved to see what that curse mark did to Sasuke. A plan for reaching the tower was quickly sketched out. Even as Sasuke groaned, his fevered sleep troubled with the pain of the tainted chakra. Neji was against the plan to begin with. If he is fated to live, he will. Otherwise, he will slow us down, as weak as he is, he stated. Naruto glared at his fiancé's cousin, but Hinata's hand on his arm kept him from losing his temper. Then don't help, Neji ni san, she replied. But since your team is going that way anyway, we will all go with you. If your defending yourself happens to benefit us, then I guess your precious, fate, doesn't govern what we do, does it? Neji had no answer for that, and settled into a grumpy silence. All right, Shino said, as he and Shikamaru rose from where they'd laid out the plan to the others. Does anyone have any thoughts on the plan? Looking around at the other Konoha rookies, he saw no objections, and nodded. The speed with which Shikamaru had laid out a plan once Naruto asked for one pointed to him considering a similar scenario at some point, and such forethought almost guaranteed the young man's rise to Chunin at some not too distant time, even if he didn't manage it here at these exams. Shikamaru had been somewhat lazy, very much a boy to go for, least effort for most effect, until this Shinshi sensei had gotten hold of Team 10's training. Now he actually had greater endurance and chakra reserves that he could bring to bear, not an insignificant thing for his family's techniques. Team 9's role was vanguard. With such hitters as Neji and Lee, and Tenten's skill with storage scrolls and weapons, which her adoptive father, Yanagi Jobu, had been teaching her for years before the academy, they made an effective forward strike force, intended to clear the path. Team 10 was to provide close support for Team 7 
with Choji carrying the unconscious Sasuke as both teams made their run. With both Sakura and Ino looking out for him, Sasuke could not be in more protective hands, although Shikamaru idly pondered who was going to protect the Uchiha boy from them. Finally, Team 8 had a sort of rearguard position. Not only did they have to cover the back of the other teams, but they were the decoys, meant to attract the attention of anyone who came after the weakest, Genin. Strangely, that last twist was suggested by Naruto, a minor touch compared to the overall plan, but it was an idea that had merit in Shikamaru's eyes, so it had to be a good one. The other teams had barely left the clearing, with a surreptitious escort of a few shadow clones, when the first challenge to the plan occurred. As three ninja wearing Hite 8 bearing the emblem of a crescent moon, the sign of Yorugakir no Sato, the village hidden in the night, entered the clearing. As the two opposing teams stood and stared at each other, the Yuru ninja began to grin, feral grins that bore little resemblance to the smiles of amusement most people gave, and seemed more suited to hunting animals who found their prey. High in the tree, Kabuto sat up. So many little dramas, so much variety to choose from, and this eventuated. He was sure the Odogakir team would have confronted the Konoha ninja by now, but they were apparently too busy elsewhere, but here. Here he got to see the capabilities of this team aid of Konoha, Team Kurunai if they made Chunin together, unless she went for a different name, and he got to assess the totally unknown techniques of what may have been the most secretive of the Shinobi villages, the oldest existing village, barely younger than the lost Uzushiogakir no Sato. Closer attention was merited, the strangers didn't speak, Hanada noticed. Instead, they merely set themselves ready to fight, and charge. As they did, their bodies shifted just a little, becoming more animalistic, taking on features of animals here and there. The one that rushed the Hyuga in the Uzumaki jacket seemed to be melded, if that was the right term, with a rabbit of all things. Hinata activated her Byakugan and saw the chakra condensing in the opposing Kunoichi's legs. It would be a good idea to avoid the kicks, then. Shino's foe had horns, two of them, appear along his nose as his skin grayed and thickened, his charge becoming vicious and almost unstoppable. Raising his staff and extending it from its collapsed and portable form, he braced. This would need some time. Naruto's foe on the other hand, that was trickier. His hair had been replaced by feathers, his eyes became a solid black, and wings emerged from his back as his feet left the ground in more of a swoop than a charge and the two ninja that he raised were aimed straight at the Konoha Jinchiriki. The deep cover spy certainly hadn't been expecting this. Orochimaru had dabbled in this branch of research at one time, with no real success due to the burnout its subjects suffered, before deeming it inferior and discarding it. Now it looked like someone had perfected it. This was worth noting. Kabuto took out a scroll and started taking notes very quickly, as Hinata ducked beneath another kick. Her opponent lifted her other foot from the ground and it swept past Hinata's face as she leaned back just barely enough for it to miss, her fringe and bangs flying up in the passing foot's slipstream, even as the rabbit girl cartwheeled to land on her feet. Seeing the first opening she'd had this fight, the young Hyuga darted in, melding wind and water chakra into her gentle fist, producing something like a storm in her opponent's tenketsu. A gentle storm, that sounded like a good name. The wind element caused actual damage to the chakra coils, while the water element allowed the gentle fist impact to shock wave out from the point of impact, shutting down multiple tenketsu at once. Struck in the lower back, the Yuru Kunoichi lost the center of her chakra network right away, and her animal features disappeared as she collapsed, unable to move her legs. Naruto's usual techniques wouldn't work on this enemy, and he knew it. He could try bombarding the Hawkman with shadow clones, but with those wings, the other ninja could change direction in midair, and Naruto's clones couldn't. Not easily. There was only one moment he could strike his foe, at the very moment his foe struck him. Extending his claws, Naruto began to channel chakra to his ears. His sense of smell was of no help here, Hinata and Shino had their own problems, and to top it all off, his passenger chose this moment to start making a ruckus. Whiskers, brat, the Kyubi was shouting as Naruto tried to focus. Cats and foxes have them for a reason. You have to feel him with your whiskers. 
Naruto managed to push the fox's voice down beyond his awareness, but something rang true. Expanding his chakra a little, he fed it into his whisker marks as well. As they flared blue and grew, he felt something. The wind? No. Motions that shifted the wind. A fox or cat used its whiskers to tell how far away something was, to help with balance, or to shift in confined spaces. Combined with his hearing, Naruto had a chance. Just one, because once his opponent knew about this trick, he'd compensate for it, and Naruto would lose. His only advantage now lay in surprise. Shino stared at his now unconscious foe as he discarded his shattered staff. That had been too close, he felt. His staff had broken just as his kakaichu had managed to take his enemy down from chakra exhaustion, a very close thing. His insects were now gorged on the chakra, and would be of little help until they'd slept it off, or discharged it in another manner. He turned towards the others as Hinata took out her opponent, and saw Naruto's whisker marks glow, and then very nearly shine, as he poured chakra into them. It was over in a split second, but for that split second Hinata's heart was in her throat, her Byakugan, still active, allowing her to see the whole thing with absolute clarity. The hawk ninja swooped in, too fast for Shino to follow, his blades aimed at Naruto's back, and Hinata could do nothing but stand there, screaming her beloved's name. Naruto felt the movement, he knew the direction, he pushed the distraction of his love's scream away so he could live and manage to come back to her. He turned in an instant, stabbing out with his claws and twisting his arms outward, even as he poured chakra into the bones of his skull, plating and studding his forehead with bone metal, and a layer of chakra cushioning his brain. The blades his foe had in front of him were swept aside by Naruto's claws, the cheap metal breaking as they twisted, carrying the hawk ninja's arms with them, and the blonde shinobi swung his head against his opponents, impacting square on his foe's hit eight. Naruto had been wearing his hiatai eight around his neck of late, much like Hinata did, and his bone metal brow was far stronger anyway. There was a horrendous sickening crunch as the swooping Hawkman collided with the young Genin, and both crashed to the ground, rolling and tumbling across the clearing, bleeding off the inertia and momentum of the collision before halting in a heap. Hinata was the first there, her Byakugan shutting off in a subconscious choice to avoid seeing the worst for as long as possible, and Shino joined her at the tangled pile of limbs as the Hawk features faded from the Yuru Ninja. That one was dead, she could see. Not only did his neck loll at a most unnatural angle, she knew that the forehead was supposed to curve outwards. His didn't, and his hit a8 was embedded in the brow as well. Using branches, they forced the body off their teammate. Naruto's eyes were unfocused, and his neck and back were sore, although the pain was rapidly retreating. There was a red mark on his forehead once the bone metal had retreated, and he looked up. Am I dead, and in heaven? he asked, very confused. No, a worried Hinata replied, why would you think that? Because I see three Hinatas, and if even one's not heaven, I don't want to go, the blue-eyed Jinchuriki answered with a goofy smile. After that fight, they decided to waste no time, and quickly set off in pursuit of their fellow Konoha rookies. In the tree far above, Kabuto stood, putting away the scroll with so much written on it, it seems that Orochimaru-sama was correct about the kimonohito inferiority, he mused silently. Beast people seem to rely more on instinct than intellect. But that Uzumaki, that most certainly wasn't the dead bone pulse, but it was close to it. Did that experiment work, after all? What else happened though? That thing with his whisker marks. The speed he recovered at. Those bones looked like metal, too. Did we awaken a new Keke Jenke in the boy? Either way, it looks like we discarded him too soon. I think I'll drop out after this round. I won't be very useful if I'm dead. The atrium of the tower was empty, and the poetic advice inscribed on the wall was an obscure reference to training methods. Shino managed to put the clues together and opened their scrolls, each team having kept their heaven and earth scrolls to bring here. Naruto was sitting propped against a pillar, still a bit concussed, although he was getting better so fast it was almost miraculous. Five minutes more, tops, and he'd be fine. As the scrolls poured out smoke, their sensei appeared before them, smiling broadly. Kuranai had heard from the other teams as they arrived about the events in the forest, 
although her team had obviously had a little more trouble afterwards. But that was what they had been the decoys for. The hard job, the one the other teams were not as suited for. Welcome to the tower, Team 8, she said, pride evident in her tone. Congratulations on passing the second exam. Her eyes traveled over her students, assessing their injuries, and attempting to divine their mental state. Before anything else, your friends made it in plenty of time, and Kakashi has called on someone far more experienced with seals than he to deal with Sasuke's affliction. There's someone else in a similar situation to Sasuke who can provide some counseling, but we can't be certain he'll be okay at this point. She waved for them to follow her. Now, you've been out there for two and a half days, so I think you'll all want to get clean, fed and rested. There's a three-person room set aside for each team in this tower, so you have somewhere to rest up as you wait. The room was comfortable enough, and the three genin greeted the other Konoha rookies. As other nations' teams were present, there were no vast displays of boisterousness, and the information they handed around was low-level gossip at most. Ino and Sakura were both worried about Sasuke, when they weren't quietly hissing at each other over who loved him more, and their friends looked out for them. When the Suna team showed up, they didn't approach, although Gara did stare somewhat obsessively, almost hungrily at Naruto. The teams that made it in over the next two days were mostly foreign. Kumo's team, the inverted squad consisting of a young man named Ginkumo Kura, and two girls, the Nusuma sisters as they were called, Fukuro and Suzume, despite their looking nothing alike, with their sensei, a dark-skinned man answering to Sagigiso, were polite, although the genin of the team paid closer attention to Hinata and Neji than any others. It was possible that Kumogakure's first official representatives to enter Konoha in a decade were nervous about the Hyuga incident from so long ago, but that answer didn't feel right. The Iwa team were much more easy to explain, even if their famous sensei kept watching Naruto for some reason. That ruby eye gave him the creeps. The genin were a different matter. Kiyareki Koshi and Tamaishi Tobu were of a type. Both were obviously heavy hitters who could hold their own, with thickly muscled bodies. Their teammate however, resembled a marble statue more than a little, a delicate one that belonged in some noble's hall, rather than a kunoichi. Still, there was that adage about books and their covers, and judging them thereby. The fourth foreign team was from a smaller, newly established hidden village, Odogakure no Sato, and consisted of a young man with enough bandages covering him to qualify as an emergency ward, another boy who kept his palms hidden, and a kunoichi with a large number of small pouches all over her clothes. All three kept to themselves, not giving out their names, and wore pants with a snakeskin pattern in blue. The last team to arrive, barely ahead of the deadline, was another Konoha team, Kabuto's team to be precise, and all the genin teams were called to assemble in the atrium. There had been a lot of changes made to it, with a raised dais at one end before a massive statue of a shinobi performing a hand sign. There was a raised balcony around the room, and it was here that the many sensei stood as their teams assembled below. Sasuke was there, the mark on his neck ringed by two circles of tiny seals so close together they could be mistaken for a single circle. His eyes were a little shadowed, from a lack of sleep, no doubt, and he gruffly muttered his thanks to Team 8 as he took his place. On the dais stood the Hokage, as well as the sensei of the foreign teams and the proctors from the Chunin exams. The unfamiliar proctor was a sickly-looking man, but he still stood there, a Konoha ninja to be sure. Hiruzen stepped forward and began to speak. Congratulations to all of you here who have made it to the next stage of the exams, the little war that stands in place of actual war between the nations. It is here that our genin show what they can do, and the strength of their villages is represented in the third exam, single combat. As things, a cough from the third proctor interrupted the old man, and the the sickly ninja spoke. Your pardon, Hokage-sama, but if you don't mind, I can take over from here. As the Hokage stepped back, waving for the proctor to continue, the ninja coughed again. My name is Gekko Hayate Kof and I am the proctor for the next stage of the Chunin exams, he announced. As things stand, Kof there are too many candidates to undertake that next step, so we will be holding preliminary matches immediately, to determine who advances to the tournament stage in one month's time. 
The cough first thing I must ask is if any of you here wish to withdraw at this time. Kabuto raised his hand. Our efforts outside have depleted my chakra and stamina, he explained, even as Ibiki exchanged a glance with the Hokage, receiving a barely perceptible nod. I have to formally withdraw. As he turned and walked away, he muttered to his companions. You know what to do. The proctor watched him leave and nodded. Is there anyone else? Very well. He pointed to a large electronic display screen, a rarity anywhere, which might be a form of boasting should one choose to take it that way. A great hidden village flaunting its wealth with such a thing. If you will pay cough attention to the board, we will randomly select the cough opponents for the preliminaries. As the board began to flicker, a name and picture appearing on each side and changing as they were randomized, Sasuke snorted in disbelief of the proctor's statement. Such matchups were far too important to leave to chance. Then the two names appeared on the board. Hayuga Hanada versus Kinuda Dosu. The other genin were instructed to leave the floor and head up to the balcony, but Naruto took a few seconds to embrace his fiance. You can beat him Hanadaheim, he whispered into her ear. But watch out, all right, when he moves his arms, my ears hurt. With a quick kiss on her cheek, he went to stand by Kurunai and Shino. The bandaged swathed auto ninja stood before her, his arms dangling and his feet wide set. So, did your boyfriend say goodbye? Or is he going to join you in hell? The foreign ninja taunted. Actually, the soft-spoken Kunoichi replied, he was telling me to kick your, Hajime, called Hayate, his voice washing over Hinata's. As Hinata's Byakugan roared to life, filling her senses with her surroundings, filing away Naruto's reactions and words for later, her opponent rushed forwards, his arms swinging, a faint whistling following as they moved. She could see the chakra flowing into his arms, collecting in the many hold devices there, as clearly as she could see Naruto's wince as the noise reached him. The only advantage she could see was that his moves seemed to require a build-up, a long sweeping strike. If he charged, as he'd done now, whatever attack he was planning would have that build-up and he could use a linear strike, but otherwise he would need roundhouse blows. Dodging his first attack was the way to go, then, and after that stay in close quarters where the gentle fist technique's linear style would be faster than his return strike. But he seemed too confident, she noticed, her Byakugan relaying the sloppiness of his taijutsu style, as if he didn't care whether or not he hit, because he only needed to get close. Dosu grinned beneath his bandages as the girl's eyes widened. She was obviously terrified by the speed and ferocity of his assault, not that he'd go easy on her for that. As he pulled his arms back to strike, she did, something. And a set of bracers and greaves hit the floor as she disappeared, only to suddenly be there in his face, with his arms out of position to block, a determined look on her face as both her own arms struck at his shoulders, palm first, calling out, gentle storm, chakra shockwave. Indeed, that was exactly what it felt like, as his shoulders popped audibly with her strikes and a wave of chakra rippled down his arms, blowing out his chakra network from the inside painfully, dispersing all his gathered chakra in a single burst with no way to control it. Dosu couldn't understand it. Just seconds ago she'd been terrified, he'd seen her eyes widen, how did this happen? His momentum redirected by her attack his legs flying forward even as his torso stopped all forward motion, the auto genin spotted, as he arced over, crashing head first onto the stone tiled floor, the veins around her eyes, a Hayuga. He'd been up against the cursed Baikugan, his impact with the floor disrupted his awareness as he hit, a concussion at the least if he was any judge, the nausea felt about right for it, and any disorientation now was. His mind blanked out as the last thing he saw before falling into the darkness of sweet oblivion was a rapidly approaching palm. Hinata watched her unconscious foe for a moment. She had pulled her blow before impact and the gentle storm strike she'd been working on had still knocked her foe cold. She was certain that if she'd made contact it would not have gone so well for this dosu. Swallowing audibly, Gekko Hayate then raised his right hand. The winner, cough cough Hayuga Hinata. Looking up at the balcony, all that Hinata could see, or care about was the broad smile of pride and joy on Naruto's face. Kurunai smiled as she looked across to where Shinshi stood with Asuma and Team 10. 
Pick me up at seven, Asuma, she said, and the other Jonan nodded blankly. Now she got her fancy dinner rather than going to that barbecue place, and Asuma would know better than to bet against her in matters involving her team. The board was flickering again revealing the next two to fight, and as she saw Hanada in Naruto's arms, speaking softly about whatever, she hoped they'd have some time before Naruto's fight. Yanagi Tenten vs. Akamichi Choji Tenten and Choji's match didn't take very long, as Choji opted to use his human boulder technique from the start. Tenten, however, didn't hesitate, sending forth an array of kanai that were deflected by her fellow Konoha Jenin's spinning form. As Choji advanced, she then threw another volley, this one of Senbon, that littered the ground in front of him, stuck upright in the floor. The young Akamichi's own force and speed drove the paralytic coated needles into his skin, and Choji was done. Winner, Kaf Yanagi Tenten, proclaimed Hayate, as the board began to select the next match. Abumi Zaku vs. Nusuma Suzume. No sooner had the cough ridden proctor called Hajime, the Zaku raised high arms, palm outwards, towards the Kumo Kunoichi, whose hands were flickering through hand seals incredibly quickly, so quickly that only Kakashi and Sasuke could keep up with them. At first nothing seemed to happen as Suzume completed the last seal, but then Zaku's eyes widened, and he begged him to unleash wind blasts at something only he could see, hammering away at thin air as he stared and screamed, while Suzume calmly announced her technique. Genjutsu Technique Hyaku Suzume no Jigoku Calmly walking up to her now terrified foe, still striking blindly at things no one else could see, Suzume jabbed a sleep venom-coated needle into his neck, and the auto ninja was out like a light. As Hayate called the winner, everyone reassessed the small, plain girl with mousy brown hair, with a genjutsu like that under her belt, she was far, far more than she looked to be. Again the board flickered, and the next to fight were revealed. It was impossible. Fate was never this kind, as to grant this kind of heartfelt wish. Neji turned his attention to the Uchiha, and saw the smirk, and realized what had to have happened. Someone had heard of his encounter with this boy before the first exam, of the fight Lee had stopped, and set this up for the last loyal Uchiha. Again he returned his attention to the board and the matchup displayed there as he descended the stairs at the same deliberate pace as his opponent. Uchiha Sasuke vs. Hayuga Neji. Hayate glanced nervously at the Hokage, who nodded. This fight, no matter who won it, would upset the current balance of power in Konoha. If it fell towards the Uchiha, the civilian counselors would gain, and by further implication, the elder advisors, and Danzo. If Hayuga Neji came out on top, Hiyashi and the other shinobi clans would benefit. Hajime, he called. It began with a series of rapid hand signs by the Uchiha boy, as he attempted the genjutsu the Kumo Kunoichi had so badly beaten her opponent with. But Neji's Baikugan easily penetrated the illusion, shattering Sasuke's technique. The Sharingan was not precise enough to mimic the Tenketsu blocking effect of the gentle fist and the elemental natures required for gentle storm were beyond the Uchiha. They were also beyond Neji, who was firmly earth aspected in his affinity, not that he developed it. So Neji closed as Sasuke began to perform another jutsu. Sasuke's water prison was a half-remembered technique, seen months ago and never practiced. Even with his Sharingan, Sasuke nearly didn't pull it off, but as the water was pulled out of thin air, he realized this was a bad technique for him. It had to have taken at least two-thirds of his remaining chakra to pull off with both his own natures opposed to it. Of course, it might have been worth it, with the overconfident Hayuga inside the globe of water. Sasuke began to run through a new sequence, almost losing the prison as he did. It was hard to split your chakra control like that, and the globe of water rippled, even as the Uchiha boy manifested a needle of lightning chakra that he drove towards the globe. Neji had been startled by the water prison, and had gasped, a good thing as it seemed, giving him lungs filled with air. He began to worry as Sasuke ran through the hand seals to enact the lightning needle, but when the surface of the globe, and the chakra holding it in shape, rippled, he saw an opportunity. As the needle was thrust towards the water prison, Neji struck, his gentle fist strike punching through the weakened surface of the water and jabbing into the tenketsu on Sasuke's arm dispersing the needle. 
A second strike, delivered as Sasuke lost control of the water prison, took away the other arm's channels, and Neji slid into the 8 trigram stance. Sasuke didn't stand a chance as Neji launched his attack. 8 trigrams, 64 palms. As an incapacitated Sasuke dropped to the floor, Neji turned away. Even you, a mighty Uchiha, could not overcome fate, he said, and took a step as Hayate called the winner. The sudden surge of killing intent from the boy on the floor froze almost everyone in the room. As Neji looked back, he saw Sasuke forcing himself to his feet, and the Byakugan showed a black, negative chakra blowing open his tenketsu points. But the scary thing was his eyes. Sasuke's eyes were still rolled back in his head, he was still unconscious. A shock of fear poured through Neji as he stood there, unable to move, and suddenly Kakashi was there, making a hand seal that caused the second ring of seals around Sasuke's curse mark to flare, and the Uchiha air collapsed. The copycat ninja lifted his student over one shoulder. I see we still need to work on containing it, he said. With a quick and awkward bow, he disappeared in a swirl of leaves, as did the second proctor, the purple-haired Kunoichi, as the board again flickered, distracting most witnesses from what had just happened. Kabuto looked at the bodies strewn about him. He supposed he should be flattered, for Anbu just for him, but this meant something was wrong. He'd just have to cut his losses and take his current information back to Orochimaru. It was just a pity he'd have to wait to see how the little experiment had turned out. Gara vs. Suchi Kin. Oh, hell, no. I forfeit. The Otto Kunoichi ignored the angry stare from the Suna redhead. I am not facing that. Shrugging, the watchers turned their attention to the board again. Konkuro vs. Kiareki Koshi. The opening strikes of the match saw the muscular body of Koshi stock still and immovable, as Konkuro dropped his bundle and rushed in, assaying a few strikes that were easily deflected before dropping his jaw as if on a hinge, and spraying a purple mist into the surprised Iwa ninja's face. Even as the impossibly strong counter blow shattered, Konkuro's, right arm, scattering chunks of wood about the room even as the, bundle, that had been dropped earlier unraveled and stood, revealing the real Konkuro, and the one that had engaged the foe was just a puppet. Enraged, Koshi took one step, and toppled over. The purple mist is a paralytic toxin unique to Keis no Kuni and Suna village, he told the Iwagakir shinobi as he held up a vial of silvery liquid. This is the antidote. Without TIHS, the toxin's effects run their course over a week. A painful one. I'm told it feels like fire ants swarming you. Give up, and I'll be generous. Koshi couldn't surrender fast enough. Abarame Shino vs. Nara Shikamaru. As the two genin faced each other across the arena, Shikamaru sank into a crouch and put his fingers together. He just sat there for ten minutes. Not wishing to waste his own chakra, and respecting another strategist, Shino let him. Eventually, Shikamaru stood and began to walk away. I forfeit, he said back over his shoulder. Maybe my shadows can pin you down, Shino, but there's too many of your kakaichu for me to keep track of. And once they get into my chakra, that's all she wrote. I don't have any jutsu for dealing with them. Blinking, Ino spoke up. Sort of. Wa? Shinshi shook his head as he explained to her. Shikamaru's affinity is water, surprisingly. Fire jutsu, which would be the best option for dealing with Shino's insects, chew through too much of his chakra. While certain water jutsu might work, the effects of using them would likely cause his colony to revolt. The results aren't pretty. So Shikamaru took the chance to bow out gracefully. The fourth gentleman narrowed his eyes. But he's not getting off that easily. A mind like that deserves to be a chunin. They turned their eyes to the next matchup. All around the atrium, jaws dropped, and a loud, energetic whoop sprang from both participants, who promptly leapt over the railings. Uzumaki Naruto vs. Rock Lee. As the two Konoha ninja waited tensely for Hayate to call for the fight to begin, Guy appeared next to the Hokage. If you will excuse me, Hokage-sama, perhaps we should move this gathering to the balcony? Raising an eyebrow, and receiving a serious-faced nod, Hiruzen agreed. When Hayate called, Hajime, the two genin moved, quick strikes to test their opponent's defenses. They sprang back after a few blows, Lee shaking out his hands. 
Your body is quite sturdy, Naruto-san, Lee said, once more balling up his fists. Your inner youth is quite impressive. You're pretty fast, Lee San, Naruto replied, but I can keep up if I push it a bit. There was another blur of motion as Lee charged in sweeping a leg in a low feint that changed direction halfway, and powered towards the Jinchuriki's ribs. Naruto's reaction was to grip the leg as it struck, pinning the limb against his body, and Lee's other foot left the ground in a spiraling arc that caught Naruto on the crown of his skull with a loud and terrible crack forcing him to release the spandex-clad young man who cartwheeled back and stopped, dropping to one knee. The blonde shook his head, and a little blood flew from his scalp. Hinata covered her mouth with both hands, her fingernails digging into her cheeks, but unwilling to look away. The Jonin looked on, wondering what the crack had been caused by, as Guy stood by the railing. Naruto had taken that blow direct to his crown, from Lee's full-strength kick admittedly with his training weights on, actually from the training weights themselves. And he was a little dizzy with a small scalp wound? What had happened? Was that sound from the boy's skull, or Lee's leg? Guy Sensei, Lee called out, no pain evident in his voice, which set Guy's mind a little at ease as he turned. It was a pity about Naruto losing, but a head injury that cracked the skull was nothing to laugh at. What is it, Lee? He called back. I am requesting permission to remove my weights, Guy Sensei, Lee replied. Three on my left leg have been broken, and I believe Uzumaki-san presents an adequate adversary, a most youthful rival, to overcome. Guy tried to wrap his mind around this odd fact. Lee's training weights, on impact with Naruto's skull, had broken? But they were steel, engraved with special gravity seals to both make them heavier and extend their influence over the entire body. When steel, especially that steel, met bone, it shouldn't be the bone that broke the steel. He looked over at the orange-clad shinobi, who had taken a cloth from his pocket to clean the blood from his face and staunch the bleeding, as he put said cloth away. He wasn't bleeding anymore, and he'd done little more than swipe absently at the wound. It was hard, but it had to be done. Permission granted, Lee, but exercise good judgment and caution. A delighted Lee jumped up the weights from his leg warmers in each hand. Thank you Guy Sensei, he yelled with joy, oh, yes, and youth. As he dropped the weights, which cratered the floor on impact, clouds of dust thrown high in the air. How much did those things weigh, was the incredulous thought that ran through every mind present but two. One of these was made a guy, and the other his student. Then Lee vanished from view, incredibly too fast to follow with the eye and suddenly Naruto was launched skywards from a kick he did not anticipate hammering into his jaw from below. As he soared through the air, Lee was suddenly there again, driving him in another direction with a hefty kick to Naruto's gut. This was not good. Naruto channeled his chakra into his whisker marks, and tried to feel the wind, as he'd done in the forest against the Yuru ninja, and was successful. It was of limited value, however, as Lee's speed was too great for him to do more than roll with the blow, reducing the actual injury. It was as the blue-eyed Jinchuriki sailed across the room, parallel to the floor, that he got some idea of how much trouble he was in, as Lee's bandages, that had been wrapped about the older boy's wrists, lashed around Naruto, trapping him for whatever was about to happen, and thus strapped together, they began to spiral towards the floor, picking up speed as they plunged towards the stone, with Lee jumping clear at the next to last second. Sensing Lee was clear, Naruto now felt no compunction in unleashing his bone metal, the spikes driving outwards, and sections of him simply playing over with it, his chakra recklessly poured into surviving, even as the floor cratered again, and dust from the impact hid the floor of the room. Lee appeared, panting, on the raised fingers of the shinobi statue. He was uncertain what was different about Naruto, but every time he'd kicked or punched the boy it had hurt, especially when the bone was close to the surface of the flesh. Lee ached all over, at every impact site, and he was exhausted. With the sole exception of the two Hyuga, who had their Baikugan active, no one could see through the dust, and while Hinata may have been reassured by what she saw, Neji's eyes were bulging far more than even the Hyuga bloodline limit could account for. Inside the settling dust, Naruto was slowly pulling in his bony spikes and plates. 
he was nearly running on fumes, and he didn't want too many people to see his Keke Jenke active yet. One more month, that was all he needed. Lee had really done a number on him. Naruto was hurting all along his skeleton, and although he knew he'd recover faster than anyone else, he also realized that his psycho Katsuryoku was much, much slower when his chakra was depleted. He struggled to his feet as the dust dispersed, shocking Guy and Lee as he took hold of his head and stretched, one way then the other, each time causing a series of popping sounds. That's better, he said, bracing himself to continue. Shall we? Lee stared at Naruto. When he'd realized he'd just performed the primary lotus on a younger ninja, he had at first been alarmed, having responded more by muscle memory than by conscious decision. He'd been terrified that he'd killed his fellow Konoha Genin. Now, the terrified feelings came from something else entirely. After that, Naruto stood up and wanted more. He looked across to Gai Sensei, who shook his head. Opening the gates would strain him further, and the damage would almost certainly take months to recover from, if he did. Standing, he spoke clearly. I see no benefit to continuing this fight, he announced. Proctor, I forfeit this match. Hayate shook his head. These were strange circumstances indeed. Winner, Kaf Uzumaki Naruto. Naruto trudged up the stairs, a clue for those who knew him well, although Lee moved no faster. As he got closer to Hinata, he almost cringed beneath her loving gaze. I'm sorry if I worried you, he told her. I know, she replied, but we are shinobi. I don't ask that you stop going forth. I ask that you always come back to me. It's a promise, he declared. Believe it, she nodded and whispered. Always, Hinata Haim, he murmured. Hi, Naru-kun, I love you very much, he answered, but I'm going to fall over now. As he suited the deed to the word, she caught him, gathering him close as he slept, his head pillowed on her lap. Guy and Lee reassessed Naruto, again. The boy had been virtually running on the fumes of his chakra, and he'd bluffed Lee into a forfeit. This one was worth watching closely indeed. Inazuka Kiba vs. Nusuma Fukuro. Kiba was dismissive of his opponent as he and Akamaru strode from the bottom step to the middle of the room. Her white hair and dark eyes didn't register as measuring him at all. As she stopped, a good 15 feet from him, she was looking at Akamaru. Tugging her jumpsuit to be a little more comfortable, she adjusted the thick leather gauntlet that covered her right arm to the elbow, with its plated knuckles and open palm and fingers. So you work with a canine partner. That makes you an Inazuka, and a male one. Loud, opinionated, but loyal and focused. You might be a worthy foe, she said, calmly assessing him. Ha! Kiba barked. You know it, but this is a fight where you're outnumbered. While Akamaru and I work as one, there are two of us to the one of you. The Kumo girl gave a soft smile. She was not a delicate little thing like Suzume, but she was a pretty young Kunoichi. Still, that smile. But Inazuka-san, whoever said I was alone? She threw her arm out to one side, while making an odd call one he'd occasionally heard at night, and a huge, white owl swooped silently down to land on Fukuro's gauntleted arm. This is Shirahime, and I think you'll find two on two odds more than enough to deal with as you are. Hayate's call to begin set the stage, but with two to deal with, Kiba went straight to the big guns, pulling out a food pill and hurling it to Akamaru, even as Fukuro set Shirahime to wing. The white owl was fast, intercepting the food pill and swallowing it herself as Kiba gasped. He didn't know the bird could move that fast. Shirahime returned to Fukuro as she spoke. Thank you Inazuka-san, and I was told that male Inazuka were terrible to their guests, she teased, as Kiba hurried to find another pill. Even as he found it, she was unleashing a very familiar, if somewhat modified technique. Twin soul clones. She called as Akamaru crunched it and swallowed the second pill, the backup Kiba had in case he needed it, as now. The figures that emerged from the smoke were a blend of the girl and the owl, white feathered wings spread high and wide, and they both launched into the air. Man-beast clones. Kiba cried as he and Akamaru used the Inazuka version of the jutsu. Two somewhat canine Kibas now stood there and prepared their special move as something hit the floor in front of them, and burst into blinding light before either could look away. Blinded, unable to hear Fukuro or Shirahime as they swooped in, 
neither was able to defend themselves against the silent aerial onslaught that left them trussed up like chickens in reams of ninja wire. Winner, Kof Nusuma Fukuro Kof, declared the proctor. Even as Kiba struggled free of the wire, Akamaru just dispersing the jutsu freed himself that way. His partner barked at him, admiring their opponent's strength and teamwork. This Fukuro had, in a way, reminded him of his mother. Oh, Kami, he thought, recognizing a bigger, stronger version of what he'd felt towards Hanada. I'm in love, Akado Yoroi versus Tamari, Hajime, called Hayate, and a massive gale force typhoon smashed past him, driving the, Konoha, Shinobi a good foot into the wall behind him before he fell forward, collapsing as the wind from the Suna Kunoichi's fan dispersed. Winner, Tamari Kof, Surugi Masumi versus Tamaishi Tobu. Tamaishi may have looked a virtual clone of his teammate Koshi, but where his friend preferred a sturdy defense, Tobu was an artillery piece, favoring the long-range jutsu. So when Masumi jumped back to gain the distance to use his own technique, dislocating and stretching his limbs, the Iwa ninja was already making hand seals. Flying avalanche jutsu, a number of rocks tore their way through the floor and whistled as they flew through the air towards the hapless shinobi opposing Tobu. All his flexibility helped little against a torrent of stone pinning you down and dropping rocks on your skull. Winner cough, Tamaishi Tobu. Hayate was very impressed. Masumi was just pressed. Yamanaka Ino vs. Ginku Mokura. Ino took her place on the atrium floor after a few repairs had been made, and faced her opponent, a short, slender man with a number of kanai in hand, who actually crouched, balanced, on a kanai he'd embedded in the floor. His eyes were never at rest, constantly in motion, and she recognized that expression on his face of boredom. This was a strategist like Shikamaru. This would not be easy. As the fight began, she remembered her new sensei's advice. If they know your name, he'd said, then they have a good chance of knowing what you can do with it. So do something else, something they won't expect, to buy yourself time. It does take time to make that focusing seal the Yamanaka Jutsu require, so cut it to the bone. And she had, training so that her seal was faster than she'd ever dreamed possible. She'd vowed to herself a new goal, to master her clan jutsu until she didn't need the seals, something even her father could not do. Her opponent spoke. I'm sorry, he said. What? I'm sorry, he repeated, and expanded on his apology. That you've already lost I mean. Just luck of the draw, I guess. Ino's face flushed red with anger as she stood waiting for the proctor's call. When it finally came, she whipped her hands up to make the hand seal and Kura's voice broke through her concentration as she did. Suchi no Kuni's minds produced some of the best ninja wire, he said as his kanai swooshed past her in a wide pattern, and he waved his hands in a complex pattern. So what? Ino snapped, as she brought her hands up once more, only to find herself unable to bring them together. Raising her eyes to see her opponent, she saw the metal rings decorating his gloves, and the wires that connected to them. I thought you'd appreciate being beaten by the best, he answered as he hauled both hands upwards, tightening the wires and dragging his opponent to the floor, unable to move. Kumojutsu, Cat's Cradle, Haruno Sakura vs. Dairaseki Otome. Hayate glanced from the girl with pink hair, to the other, who looked almost albino, if it weren't for her pure jet black eyes. As he called, Hajime, and jumped back, the two girls took their stances, with Sakura in the basic Konoha Academy style, and the Iwa girl in a loose stance with fists high beside her head, standing on the balls of her feet, swaying a little from foot to foot. Despite her petite stature, Otome was considered the most dangerous member of her team, second to Ishiguma Sensei, of course. His stone bear style made him a virtual juggernaut, and was credited for his survival against the Yandaimi. He'd admittedly spent a lot of time hospitalized, but he did live. In her case, it was her keke jenke, the ishi no haifu, the skin of stone. She was almost impervious to conventional attacks, but unfortunately, paid for it with no real sense of touch. She could vaguely feel pressure, but she had to spend her entire waking life constantly paying attention to her every action. Sakura knew nothing of the marble maiden of Iwa, the adopted child of the stone bear. But she did know her own abilities, and after what she'd seen today, was wondering if she was really ready for this. 
She'd entered the exams and done her best, mostly to support Sasuke-kun, the assistance she'd given Naruto notwithstanding. He hadn't really been annoying for the past few years, and he seemed really happy to be with Hinata-chan. Still, Sakura wasn't going to stop without giving it her all, and maybe Sasuke would notice her. She struck fast, her fist blurring in a strike that would come in under the girl's guard and Sakura found herself on the floor with a burning ache in the side of her face. The Iwa Kunoichi had dropped her elbow into Sakura's fist, bouncing the strike off course, and her fist had driven into the opening, and that's where everything went white. As the pink-haired girl rose shakily, her opponent glared at her. Otome was not happy, that had been too easy. Even if she was her team's taijutsu specialist, the Konoha girl should have been able to do something, but at the last second her gaze had flicked to one side and back, gah. Her opponent was crushing on someone who was present. Otome could not stop herself from speaking. Sakura, yes? At the other girl's nod, after she'd spat out some blood, the Iwa Kunoichi continued. Your eyes are on the summit, but your feet must tread the path. Why do you fall? Sakura heard the words, and a puzzled look crossed her face. She took her stance once more, and the white-skinned Iwa sighed, taking her own. One more, then. This time, Sakura was more focused, but it didn't help overly. She saw exactly what happened this time, as she thrust a fist at her opponent's face, only for Odom to slap it aside with her hand, and continue spiraling in, her elbow connecting with Sakura's jaw. The bright side was, now both sides of her face matched. Her last try was a kick, lashing out towards Odom's midsection, but the marble maiden's rising knee swept up to prevent it, and the rest of her leg extended straight up, so that her two legs made almost a straight line up and down, as the smaller girl brought her leg down in a crashing blow, like driving an axe through wood. It was a devastating attack, even had Otome not had her keke jenke, and the cracks of Sakura's collarbone broke, along with the forearm she'd raised in a frantic and off-balance attempt to block, were clearly audible. To Sakura's surprise, she could hear Otome curse. Sorry, I think I overdid it a little, she said. No sense of touch, sometimes I misjudge the force I'm using. Sakura could feel herself passing out, and gasped a last question before she did. Wait, what did you mean about the summit and the path? Think about it, Otome answered, and it will come to you. The last thing Sakura heard before losing her hold on the waking world was Hayate calling out. Winner, cough cough Dairaseki Otome.